Welcome to this Ofsted webinar, Music Supporting the Sector. My name's Chris Stevens and I'm the National Lead for Music. In 2019, we launched the Education Inspection Framework and ran roadshows across the country to share our curriculum thinking. We recently revisited those principles and shared an abridged version of those 2019 roadshows to help make our messages as sticky as possible. You might also know that we've recently released research reviews for many areas of the curriculum, including music. And our subject leads have shared short videos that consider how pupils make progress and the implications for curriculum thinking in each subject. Our reviews and videos have been received with enthusiasm and have been followed by a series of requests for us to speak at further national, regional and local events. To make our insights as accessible as possible and to provide even more detail, we've compiled a new suite of webinars to support the sector. In today's webinar, we turn our attention to music. Please look out for further videos where our curriculum unit will cover other subject areas. Before we start, I want to emphasise what I hope will be a few reassuring points. Firstly, we've structured this video in such a way that I hope it means it will be useful and accessible for teachers working in all phases of education. Secondly, Ofsted does not expect the language or specific examples shared today to be replicated in schools. Instead, we hope that the subject specific examples shared will illustrate general principles about a high quality music curriculum and that you will find these useful as you develop and refine the curriculum in your own school. As our inspection handbook makes clear, schools have the flexibility to choose their own curriculum approaches as long as there has been sufficient thought to its content, structure, sequencing and how it is implemented. This video is divided into three sessions. In the first session, we'll begin by exploring some of the subject specific principles related to a music curriculum. This will involve us looking closely at how a curriculum can plan for pupils to get better at music. In the second session, we will consider how a music curriculum can be taught so that all pupils learn, remember and connect together what the curriculum intended. This will involve us looking at pedagogy as well as assessment. And in the final session, we will bring these principles together and consider some of the key factors to consider in a primary and secondary setting. So let's start with session one the curriculum principles in music. This webinar starts from the assumption that a central purpose of good music education is for pupils to make more music, think more musically and consequently become more musical. The case for music in the curriculum is often made from a range of different starting points. Music's place in school life is sometimes justified by reference to literature that supports its wider benefits. Among these are benefits to concentration, literacy, memory and academic achievement. This focus on the wider benefits, however, is not always helpful as it encourages a view of music as existing in the service of other subjects. What can be said with a degree of certainty is that learning music is good for becoming more musical. Playing the piano is helpful for improving piano performance. Singing in a choir supports becoming a good choral singer and writing lots of songs is a foundation for expertise in songwriting. These are wonderful things in and of themselves and they need no further justification. It is really useful 
to draw a distinction between the curriculum, what is taught, and pedagogy and assessment. When we read the curriculum thinking from some of the most eminent and prominent of educators, they are clear about how this distinction between the what and the how has been skewed for them historically. We are clear that no activity, however enticing, can be a substitute for the intended curriculum. That is not to say that learning can't be engaging. It's just simply that the what must come first. Only then can we consider the activities and pedagogy that might best lend themselves to teaching that content and ensuring it is remembered long term. So what do we mean when we refer to learning in music? Ofsted defines learning as a change to long term memory. To become better musicians, pupils must use both their conscious and their unconscious minds with the latter being developed by learning and experience. Let's first consider then the aims of the national curriculum in music. These are the aims of the national curriculum. These aims mean that music lessons often involve the three following types of activities. The activities of performing, composing, and evaluating and listening. We must be clear that these are activities. The aim of the curriculum is not simply for pupils to experience and do musical activities. It is far more ambitious. The content sections of the national curriculum provide more information about this ambition. In this section of the content from Key Stage 2 National Curriculum, it is clear that pupils should be taught and learnt to develop as musicians by becoming better performers, more sophisticated listeners. We can see the terms by increasing their accuracy, fluency, control and expression, their ability to listen with increasing oral memory. This is further exemplified in the Key Stage 3 content. Here, there is reference to pupils developing as performers by gaining an understanding of the music they play and listen to. In addition, we can see that pupils are expected to create music, compose music, by developing their knowledge of the building blocks of music, things such as keys, chords, tonalities and other devices. This brings us to the first key point of this subject video. Simply doing music is not enough. The ambition of the national curriculum is far higher than this. The curriculum's central aim is for pupils to learn to become better musicians, better performers, better composers and more sophisticated listeners. Much of the music taking place in schools will occur through performance, composing and listening activities. These are the activities defined in the national curriculum and also the division found in GCSE and A-level exams. But we must be clear, simply doing these types of activities does not guarantee the central aim of the music curriculum for pupils to become more musical. So what does it mean to become better at music in schools? This video proposes a model to support our understanding of what it means to get better at music. In this model, there are three interrelated pillars of progression that lie behind the activities of performing, composing and listening. These three pillars are technical, constructive and expressive. Technical. This is about pupils learning how and becoming better at controlling sound, whether that be through singing, playing an instrument or when using music technology. In simple terms, 
it's about learning the technique to play an instrument or become a singer. A pianist, for example, will develop part of their technique by slowly and gradually building up the motor skills to play passages of music. As time passes, their finger dexterity will develop so that they're able to perform more complex passages of music. The second aspect of this pillar includes learning how to use staff notation, which is a requirement of the national curriculum. The constructive pillar. Progression here is about deepening and broadening pupils' knowledge of how music works. We could refer to these as the building blocks of musical construction. This knowledge supports pupils in getting better at constructing and deconstructing music. In other words, it helps them to become better composers and more sophisticated listeners. There are two subcategories to this pillar. The first subcategory relates to the musical elements, which are also known as the interrelated dimensions of music. These are pitch, duration, tempo, structure, timbre and dynamics. The elements are a highly generalized way of considering music and therefore can be used as an analytical tool to describe any type of music. We can, for example, talk about the tempo, the speed of the music, when analysing a piece of reggae music, as well as a Bach chorale, or a piece in a grime style. The second subcategory are the components of composition. Rather than being generalised, like the interrelated dimensions of music, these refer to the specific building blocks or the specific components that pertain to specific types of music. These blocks can differ from musical genre to genre. For example, many of the building blocks in a pop ballad are different to those in a fugue. And thirdly, the expressive pillar. Pupils' expressive responses should become more sophisticated and nuanced as they get older. This will be demonstrated through their performances, compositions and their oral awareness. Progress in this pillar involves knowing more about music's provenance, its history, culture, social context and purpose and how these factors affect the way music is performed and created. The pillar also includes deepening pupils' knowledge of how the musical elements or the interrelated dimensions of music work together to give musical expression and musical meaning. And finally, this pillar is about pupils developing their own creative responses by applying their technical and constructive knowledge. Furthermore, as pupils develop their knowledge of the technical and constructive aspects of music, they will also develop their conception of what constitutes a quality performance or composition. These three areas interrelate and combine in what could be described as musical understanding. In making decisions about curriculum content, it's important to consider how the sequence of content develops pupils' musical knowledge and competencies over time. This subject video proposes three pillars as the basis for progression in the musical activities of performing, composing and listening. This knowledge is learned in the context of music's history and provenance, allowing pupils to make increasingly sophisticated expressive responses and to gain musical meaning. Together these pillars contribute to what could be described as musical understanding. Here we can see how the three pillars are the basis for progression in the musical activities of performing, composing and listening. For example, a pupil learning the keyboard will become a better performer 
as a result of gaining greater technical control of motor skill, a deepening understanding of how the musical elements are used in performance, as well as a deepening knowledge of the context the music was created in. Similar examples can be found for composing and listening. This illustrates the point that the pillars are interrelated and are not separate silos. This webinar has stated clearly that the ambition of the curriculum should be for pupils to become more musical. The webinar has made the case that simply doing music, taking part in musical activities, does not guarantee musical progression. Instead, curriculum designers should pay careful attention to how the curriculum purposefully and incrementally develops pupils' progress in technical, constructive and expressive aspects so that pupils can become better performers, composers and listeners. Curriculum designers in music are faced with a vast array of potential curriculum content and a relatively small amount of curriculum time to deliver that content. Consequently, designing a curriculum in music involves making choices. What is realistic? What can pupils realistically learn as opposed to experience in the time available? This should be a key consideration for curriculum designers in music. We know in some cases, pupils can be exposed to lots of different musical activities. And in some cases, they mostly end up learning very little. The curriculum is covered and the activities are taught. But what is remembered and committed to long term memory amounts to, in some cases, very little. This often does not prepare pupils well for the next stages of their education and may be one of the reasons why pupils choosing to study music at GCSE is so low. We know that developing progress through the pillars of progression in music takes time and practice. Sometimes less is more. Therefore, it is important for curriculum designers to decide on the specific curriculum goals and the specifics of the curriculum content pupils are expected to know and remember. Curriculum designers might helpfully ask themselves, how clear are we about what our pupils will know and be able to do as a result of learning this music curriculum? Let us now then think about how the curriculum can be ordered, the sequence of the curriculum, to support progression in those three pillars. Technical. We know this is about how pupils learn how to control sound with increasing fluency, accuracy and expression, whether that be through singing, instrumental playing or music technology. This is an important aspect of the curriculum because it supports pupils performing, their composing and their listening. It's an important part of the curriculum and is a foundation of practical music making. We know that this kind of learning how to knowledge in music, sometimes referred to as procedural knowledge, takes significant amounts of time and practice to develop any level of fluency. We also know that this kind of learning is particularly prone to cognitive overload. Little and often has proved to be a useful approach with regard to acquiring this type of how-to knowledge. Let's just take an example of how a pupil might develop a basic level of competence on the guitar. We will refer to this guitar performance as the composite skill. The composite skill is made up of lots of different smaller component parts as illustrated by the diagram. One key component of guitar playing is the ability to form chord shapes. 
many people starting the guitar are able to get satisfaction out of the instrument with eight basic chords that are the foundation of guitar chord playing. The full range of the instrument is opened up with bar chords, which requires a particularly unnatural hand shape. With these shapes in place, they can result in pleasing musical outcomes if combined with a series of strumming patterns. In order then to take this to the next level of playing melodies and improvisation, pupils will need to know where their notes are on the chords and begin the long process of developing some dexterity and the use of their fingers on both hands and in different ways. If we zoom back out again for a moment, we can see from this example the heavily componential nature of this learning. Learning is both gradual and iterative. Small steps need to be identified, such as the strumming patterns or learning the chord shapes, so that working memory is not overwhelmed. These small steps need to be consolidated through further engagement and practice. If they are not transferred to long-term memory, then there will be no working memory available for further learning to take place. And all of this takes time. One further principle to consider here is that one term of violin, one term of trumpet and one term of glockenspiel is unlikely to lead to any technical progress. Learning technical skill on an instrument is instrument specific and not easily transferable. Our second set of takeaway slides summarizes the main aspect of the technical pillar of progression. It underpins both accuracy and expressiveness in music. It is componential. It requires development to automaticity and it occurs in specific circumstances. Our red flag here concerns the final point made in the last slide. Cursory engagement on lots of instruments is unlikely to lead to learning. It is likely to lead to pupils experiencing a music curriculum, doing musical activities rather than getting better at music. Let's now turn to sequencing when thinking about the constructive pillar. A quick reminder that this pillar is about deepening and broadening pupils' knowledge of how music works. The constructive pillar has two subcategories, the generalised interrelated dimensions of music and the more specific components of composition. We can explore the difference through an analogy of making a cake. One way of considering the parts of the cake would be the following. The cake is brown, sweet, round. It's made of flour, eggs, sugar and fat. This is the elements, the generalised way of seeing the parts of a cake. But if we want to know how to make a cake, those generalised descriptors are unhelpful. Instead, we would need to learn the following components. How to measure ingredients. How to fold them in and how to combine them. We'd need to know about the baking time, the balance of components and an understanding of layers and thickness in cake construction. Similarly, if pupils are going to learn to become better composers, the elements of music are unhelpful. Instead, pupils need to learn about the specific building blocks of composition. Different musical styles and genres are made up of different components. We can see this in this simple diagram. First, let us think of what component knowledge, what building blocks would a pupil need to know 
in order to compose a pop ballad. This could include knowledge of how to set words to rhythms, how to write melodies that make sense and are coherent. Pupils would also need a grasp of how to harmonize a melody, which would also include knowledge of chords and chord progressions typically found in this style. And there would be many more. Let's compare that to a Brazilian samba. This would be dependent upon other component knowledge that could include how to write rhythmic ideas that are idiomatic and give the music its character. Learning how to layer the music to create interest as well as grasp the musical structures involved, which would allow for a high degree of repetition while still containing enough contrast to keep the listener interested. These examples have been heavily simplified, but serve to show that the process of composing is highly componential. So much so that it has been described by some as the ultimate composite activity. So some takeaways. The construction or deconstruction of music is dependent on an understanding of the component parts of music within each musical genre. As with any aspect of learning, these components need to be sequenced and consolidated in order for pupils to use them in a meaningful, in this case, creative fashion. Warning triangles here are likely to include the following. The frequent rehearsal of outcomes. What do we mean by this? Well, instead of learning and practicing the component parts of composition, pupils simply rehearse ready made compositions. The equivalent of painting by numbers. And sometimes pupils can be given compositional tasks that are so open ended that they overwhelm their working memory. Therefore, it may be better for pupils to complete simple compositional activities that isolate and build their understanding of component parts over time. And finally, we turn to the third of our interdependent pillars, the expressive pillar. For most people, the central aim in music education few would disagree on its importance. As pupils progress through this pillar, their expressive responses should become more sophisticated and nuanced. Some takeaways for the expressive pillar. Pupils should acquire knowledge of music's technical and constructive aspects within music's context, time, place, venue, audience. This is not about learning lots of disconnected facts about music in preparation, say, for a pub quiz. Instead, pupils are learning this knowledge in order to support and develop the quality and expressiveness of their musical responses. For example, pupils' performance of a work song is likely to be greatly enhanced if they know about the music's purpose and its social context. Gaining the knowledge of these musical meanings might sit within practical activities or be separated in the curriculum. But it's always important to bear in mind that music making is far more important than music information. The second part of this pillar is a focus on musical quality. In order to do this, one has to understand the technical and constructive qualities of the music. And our final takeaway, creative expression is one of music's most valuable purposes. The ultimate aim is for pupils' compositions to be unique and for pupils to find their own voice. But this takes time and involves the rehearsal of component parts. This brings us to the end of part one of this webinar.
curriculum principles. In summary, this webinar has proposed that the features of a high quality music curriculum are likely to include the following. A curriculum that is purposefully designed to support pupils to become more musical by incrementally developing music's technical, constructive and expressive aspects. And much of the learning in music is highly componential. As a result, it often works best when pupils have sufficient time and regular and repeated opportunities to practice and rehearse. This is why when the amount of curriculum time for music is restricted, such as having music on a carousel with other subjects, it is highly unlikely to support musical progression. This is the same for blocking, the placing of music into rare whole days instead of regular distributed learning opportunities. We now move on to part two of this webinar. This section is called Implications for Pedagogy and Assessment. A brief reminder that Ofsted does not expect the language or specific examples shared in this webinar to be replicated in schools. As our inspection handbook makes clear, schools have the flexibility to choose their own curriculum as long as there has been sufficient thought to its content, structure, sequencing and implementation. The messages we share about pedagogy and assessment are all framed as reflections on practice that might most usefully serve the content schools have decided to teach. We do not endorse a specific approach, that is for schools to decide. What we are saying, however, is that the curriculum thinking must come first, and only then can we consider the most appropriate approaches to teaching and to assessment. In this section of the webinar, we will consider how curriculum content in music might most usefully be taught in order to achieve a school's curriculum aims. The delivery of a curriculum is an art, not a science, is a message that comes through in a study of correlations between teachers' actions in video lessons and evidence of students' learning at the end of the year. Almost none of the variance was predicted from observations of the teacher. These findings were summarised by the following. This leads us to reject the idea that expertise in teaching can be defined in terms of decontextualised best practices. Our view is that correlations between teachers' actions and student learning are low, not because we haven't yet identified the right set of best practices, but because teaching itself is contextual, meaning that such correlations will always be low. Although this effectiveness is contextual, research does highlight some points to consider. High levels of teacher guidance. Let's consider pupils learning how to compose a riff. For pupils to know how to do this, an example of high level of teacher guidance might be the teacher demonstrating and modeling how to create a riff. As part of the demonstration, the teacher may share their musical thinking, talking through the musical decisions they are making and why and how these represent quality. Pupils may then be given the opportunity to create their own riffs and receive feedback on their work. That is not to say that learning how to compose a riff cannot be learned informally. In fact, one could argue that this particular concept is often learned informally. The claim here is that in a classroom music setting, which is constrained by time and cognitive load, carefully planned instruction is likely to see the greatest number of pupils remember the concept.
practice opportunities with diagnostic feedback. The feedback that takes place frequently in a classroom and the most useful will often be in the moment feedback, which supports pupils' musical progression. This feedback is most usefully given at the component level rather than the composite level with a sharp focus on musical quality. Examples of components might include whether pupils are using correct fingering when playing a melody on the keyboard in order to enhance their expressive response. Another example might be whether pupils pitch is accurate when they're singing a melody. And thirdly, whether a pupil in an A-level class has harmonized a cadence correctly is the response of quality and does it make musical sense? The clear articulation of these components in the school curriculum can support teachers in providing diagnostic feedback. This is especially helpful for non-specialists. That is to say that good formative assessment requires a clear and concise conceptualization of what is to be learned and what quality sounds like. Components the building blocks have the advantage of this clarity, unlike level descriptors, which are summative in nature and are effectively grades in prose. It is also worth saying, for this type of diagnostic feedback to be useful, it does not need to be written down. In fact, burdensome assessment procedures, such as noting down this diagnostic feedback, is likely to reduce the opportunities for teachers to give feedback. A second consideration about providing feedback is about who gives the feedback. In providing opportunities for developmental feedback, decisions need to be made about who provides it. Research suggests that in particular for novices, the feedback needs to be from someone with much greater expertise someone who understands the technical and constructive aspects of the music. This is highly likely to be a teacher because the metacognition needed to analyze and correct errors is weak in novice musicians. Let's now think about assessment more broadly in music. Assessment in music has three main purposes. One, as part of the learning process itself to aid memory and recall. For example, a teacher might decide to do a quick fire quiz on the notes on the stave with a treble clef before pupils begin to learn a new melody. Two, the provision of ongoing developmental feedback to pupils to support pupils' technical, constructive and expressive progress. And three, to judge the impact and the effectiveness of the curriculum on each child and as a whole. Do pupils know and are they able to do what the curriculum intended? This type of assessment should be infrequent, but can help teachers know whether the curriculum and its implementation is working so that changes can be made if necessary. It may be worth considering the assessment of pupils in music in terms of the technical, constructive and expressive pillars. Using assessment wisely in music. Some key points to consider when using assessment in music. For assessment to be purposeful, it is important that teachers are first clear about the specific content they want pupils to know and remember. What is it that they want to check? What content do pupils need to remember? We should also be clear that data for tracking purposes will not help teachers to identify what children need to learn. 
summative assessment should be infrequent so as not to distort the delivery of the curriculum. Burdensome documentation of progress should be avoided and assessment lessons where learning is interrupted for the purpose of verifying progress may not be a good use of time. If a school wants to report progress once a term, evidence through a summative assessment, that might amount to a summative assessment every five to 10 hours of learning in music, compared to 40 hours of learning in mathematics. This could lead to assessment driving the curriculum and is a chief danger of subject assessment schedules being driven by one size fits all school wide policies. And a final consideration. Short term performance does not always equal long term learning. The amount of consolidation needed for any procedural knowledge to be learned well enough to support the next stage of progression will be significant. Assessment schedules should not assume that one instant of success equals long term learning. Key takeaways from session two, pedagogy and assessment. The successful implementation of any curriculum will be highly dependent on teacher effectiveness as laid out in the research underpinning the education inspection framework. Although this effectiveness is contextual, research does highlight some points to consider. These include high levels of guidance from teachers should be high for novices. A category that could include A level pupils for certain learning activities. Two, one of the most effective ways in which a teacher can support their pupils to learn the intended curriculum is through feedback on task components. And finally, in music, summative assessments should be used infrequently so that they do not drive the curriculum. Session three, translating curriculum principles in the primary and secondary phases. During this part of the webinar, we will consider how some of the principles of high quality curriculum thinking can be applied in the primary and secondary phases. Before we do that though, it is worth considering the bigger picture of music in primary and secondary schools. The main plank of a school's music provision is the curriculum, which is for all pupils. In schools with a thriving musical culture, you will most likely see three other aspects. The first is the extracurricular life embodied in assemblies and in the ensembles and clubs on offer. These involve a choir as well as orchestras and bands. The extracurricular life will be helped along by providing pupils with the opportunity to learn an instrument one to one or in small groups. This is something that the school may provide itself or through connections with a local music hub. Schools may also provide memorable experiences of music through concerts and trips and workshops with professional musicians. Experiences that inspire and most importantly, model quality. But it's important to see all of this in the context of the curriculum for all at the heart of a school's musical life. Let's now consider inclusion. For many pupils, including those with special educational needs and or disabilities, music provides an alternative vehicle for communication and for expression. Two important questions for curriculum leaders to consider are, is participation in school music inclusive of the school's wider demographic? And secondly, is the curriculum accessible to send pupils? Are the building blocks defined and consolidated in a structured way to enable send pupils to become more musical? Music is so often chosen as a subject that pupils can be withdrawn from. So that pupils can catch up in other areas or receive additional support. There may be several reasons why pupils are removed from music. One may be if leaders view music as a subject that is about experiences doing music, 
they may think that pupils can slip in and out of music but still be involved. But as session one of our webinar showed, musical learning is in fact highly competential. And if the curriculum is sequenced properly, increasing and deepening the technical skills and constructive building blocks of music progressively, withdrawing a pupil from music regularly means that they will not be able to keep up. The first setting in which music will be formally encountered in schools is in the early years. The musical games and activities children play will provide a foundation on which their latter learning can develop. The focus here should be on practical music making. The principles of assessment outlined in session two also apply to music in the early years. Leaders and teachers should avoid excessive assessment that takes children away from opportunities to learn and to make music. And assessment of music through books, photographs of children being engaged in musical activities is of very limited use. It is far more important to listen to children's musical responses. We are now going to turn to considering some of the principles from session one of our webinar in the context of a primary phase. As previously stated in this webinar, the examples shared are designed to illustrate curriculum principles. Ofsted does not expect the examples shown to be replicated. There are many ways in which a school could design a curriculum that reflects the ambition of the national curriculum and the curriculum principles set out in this webinar. The key principle we will visit here is the importance of ensuring that the music curriculum supports pupils to become more musical by consciously developing the technical, constructive and expressive aspects of musical progress. Session one highlighted the fact that an important part of the curriculum is for pupils to incrementally get better at controlling sounds. This involves accuracy, expression and fluency. Learning to get better at controlling sounds should be gradual and build on what has been learned before. Therefore, the curriculum should identify small steps to be practiced and learned to automaticity before moving on so that working memory is not overwhelmed. Let's take a look at a simple example that aims to meet these principles. Here we can see a simple example of a key stage one primary curriculum. This example sets out the specifics of the curriculum content and the order which it will be taught for pupils in years one and years two. The example could also include the repertoire chosen to support this development. Importantly, the repertoire being selected to support the specific curriculum goals. We can see from this snippet of the curriculum how the year two curriculum is intended to build on the year one curriculum by incrementally developing technical aspects. Things such as widening pupils' vocal range and introducing other elements of vocal control, such as singing loudly and softly. There, of course, could be other aspects to this technical development, such as learning to sing longer phrases by learning how to breathe properly. In addition, the curriculum begins to introduce important knowledge to support pupils' constructive progression introducing pupils to the musical elements of dynamics and tempo and how these might be used to create musical meaning. Schools, of course, may choose to identify different content and sequence it differently. But the key point here is that the curriculum attempts to deliberately set out the component parts pupils will learn and to sequence these parts so pupils incrementally develop as musicians. Technical and constructive knowledge within this snippet appears to be gradual, iterative and coherent. Crucially, 
pupils in this curriculum will not just be doing singing, they will be learning to become better singers. Before moving on to the secondary phase, let's pause to consider two other key aspects of music in the primary phase. Curriculum leaders need to consider how the school's wider opportunities programme is coherently and logically sequenced into the school's overall musical curriculum. It should not be seen as a bolt on. It is worth asking yourself the question, how does our wider opportunities programme support our pupils technical, constructive and expressive progression? The second point to consider is that musical guidance is likely to include the modelling of musical examples as a method of demonstrating process as well as quality. In the previous example of the Key Stage 1 music curriculum, the teacher will need to show pupils how to sing accurately, fluently and expressively. They will also need to have a clear concept of what a quality performance should sound like so that they are able to provide high quality developmental feedback as part of the learning process. These are some of the reasons why continual professional development that supports teachers as musicians will be beneficial to teachers' confidence and their ability to deliver the curriculum well. Let's now turn our attention to music in the secondary phase. Strong music departments are often underpinned by three distinct learning environments. Music in the classroom, the taught curriculum that all pupils should experience. This is the national curriculum requirement until the end of year nine and then optional from year 10 onwards. Instrumental and vocal tuition in groups or one to one. And school ensembles such as bands and choirs. And finally, musical events and opportunities such as performing in school concerts, attending musical events, shows and working with musicians. All of these environments are crucial factors in a strong musical culture and are critically important to supporting pupils' musical progress. Because of these three distinct learning environments, music, unlike few other subjects, is dependent on flexible support from leaders and school systems to flourish. For example, the running of school ensembles and instrumental groups are dependent on music departments being able to run lessons, ensembles and concerts in groupings that are often vertical. Furthermore, one-to-one -one lessons often take place at times that either clash with the curriculum lessons or are outside of normal contact hours. Concerts need rehearsal time, which can't all take place during the normal school day. The list goes on. But these opportunities and experiences are vital to support a strong musical culture. Something for school leaders to consider is do they give music departments the time and support they need to function properly and to flourish? Let's now consider some of the principles from session one when considering the taught curriculum in the secondary phase. In our first session, curriculum principles, we saw how the aim of the music curriculum should be for pupils to become more musical, that the curriculum should support pupils to become better performers, composers, and more sophisticated listeners. The curriculum achieves this by the incremental development of three interdependent pillars, technical, constructive and expressive. In other words, does the curriculum define a useful model of progression or is it simply a series of experiences? What can realistically be learned is another crucial consideration. The whole of Key Stage 3 music in a school that does allocate an hour a week is likely to give pupils around 90 hours of learning. 
90 hours is the equivalent of approximately two working weeks. It is for this reason that curriculum designers must consider what can realistically be learned. We saw in session one how identifying specific content that pupils could reasonably be expected to master is an important part of effective curriculum design in music. Here we can see an overview of a key stage three curriculum. Just take a moment to look at it. In this overview, each term sets out the title of the unit of work and the main learning aim for the term. Let's look at this example curriculum map through the lens of our key principles. Let's consider the principle that becoming more musical involves the incremental development with three, within three interdependent pillars, technical, constructive and expressive. In other words, we can ask ourselves, does this overview suggest a curriculum that defines a useful model of progression? Is it likely to support pupils to become more musical? And secondly, can the content identified reasonably be learned in the time available? Now we know that this is just an overview. And for that reason, we cannot draw concrete conclusions. But this map suggests that this curriculum is likely to lead to a range of cursory experiences and is highly unlikely to lead to learning in long term memory. Examples that support this point are. One. It's not clear how the curriculum incrementally develops technical, constructive and expressive aspects. There appears, for instance, to be one term only on singing. How is this curriculum supporting pupils to get better at singing? On a similar note, pupils appear to have one term, approximately 10 hours, on developing the technique to use multi-tracking software. This brings us to our second point. Is it realistic to expect pupils to remember the content of this curriculum within the time available? It's not clear what constructive and expressive content pupils will have learned in order to prepare them, for example, to compose film music. The compositional components do not appear to have been considered. And it is likely that pupils will have sufficient knowledge of how to play the keyboard to be able to input their ideas into the multi tracking software. The heart of the problem here is what music teachers will be very familiar with. The curriculum designer wants to choose a diverse range of repertoire for their classes. But potentially at the expense of learning the curriculum and achieving its primary aim for pupils to become more musical. Many thanks for taking the time to watch this video today. We hope that you found it helpful. If you haven't already read them, you might also find our subject reviews helpful. Simply search by subject in your browser. Our YouTube channel also has a playlist of other subject webinars and many more videos about our work here at Ofsted. Finally, Thank you for all that you do in your school to support pupils. We wish you all the very best.